please welcome to the Talks at Google stage, Mr. Jerry Beauty. Thank you so much for joining sure. us today. Thank you. So the book is Illusion of Justice, Inside Making a Murderer and America's Broken System. I'd like to start by asking you if you could, in your words, define for us justice and how you think that the system in America has strayed from what is actually justice. Well, it's a good question. It's a, it, we could probably spend the whole day talking about what justice is and isn't. Um, you know, the one thing that, that sometimes people lose sight of is that this is a human endeavor. And, you know, whenever there are human beings involved, there are going to be different opinions about what's just and what's not. Certainly somebody who's the victim of a crime is going to have one view. Um, the, you know, person who's accused of a crime is going to have another. But real justice should be somewhere in the middle where the... Um, the people as a whole feel like justice has been served by, uh, and that's, that's why in our country we have so many processes, and, and due process is such an important thing. So that if somebody is, um, is allowed to, to you know, fully present a defense, and if the jury is really fair, um, you know, justice should be served in most cases. Now, so there are times where juries make mistakes and the innocent people get convicted. And one of, the, one of the fallacies is that, well, if a jury gets it wrong, then all you've got to do is wait for the appeal. The, the appellate court will correct it. And unfortunately, that's not the way the system's set up. The system is set up really to uh, ensure that judgments are final. And they make it very, very difficult for, um, for you to reopen a case if there has been a miscarriage of justice. Uh, it's interesting, in, in the UK, they call it that. They, they don't call it wrongful convictions. They call it a miscarriage of justice. Mm -hmm. They have commissions that are called miscarriage of justice commissions, um, where the, you know, the train sort of goes off the tracks. Something happens, and the wrong person is convicted, or there's corruption that's allowed to seep into the system. And um, you know, ultimately, uh, there's there are so many things tugging and pulling at justice, whether it's the media that's that has one agenda that they're trying to sell. Um, they used to be trying to sell newspapers. Most people don't buy those anymore. <laughs> so it's uh, clickbait, you know, where they're trying to get somebody to click on their their article. Um, but that may not really be the truth, um, and certainly it wouldn't be just if that's what if that was what the whole system was designed to, to uh, protect. Mm -hmm. So if, if it does come down to justice being about the, it's almost the greatest good for the greatest number, everybody sort of feels good that we, that justice was served in that, how does that align with the rule of law, which is a much more black and white situation? Uh, there's not a lot of room for opinion if the law is the law. Well, again, um, Part of it comes down to you have to first start with the fundamental understanding that these are human beings that are that are running the system and that there will be mistakes. And uh, I have a quote in my my book from John Adams um, before the uh, Revolutionary War, actually, when he defended he was a defense attorney and he defended um, British soldiers who were accused of massacre. Um, of uh, colonists, and in his closing argument, he he sort of paraphrased something that's that goes even long back before him to black men, and even been traced even farther back in the English common law than that. And it's the idea that um, that it's it really is better that ten guilty people go free than that one innocent person be convicted. Mm -hmm. Why? Well, as John Adams put it, it's because the uh, you know, crimes and misdeeds are so numerous that you can never prosecute every single one of them and get a conviction. But if you convict the innocent, and particularly in a death penalty case, if you convict the innocent and the innocent person is executed or faces the death penalty, then that really it upsets all of society because then the, the innocent person will say, well, if innocence isn't enough to protect me from being executed or being imprisoned for the rest of my life, why should I obey the law at all? Hmm. And once that idea kind of takes root in society, 
you have a complete disrespect for the law, and the rule of law will not exist at all. So, I mean, those are some of the, the fundamental uh, principles that even though the rule of law is very, very important, it's supposed to err on the side of, um, you know, protecting the innocent rather than uh, what I think all too often nowadays people think is, well, if, you know, innocent person is convicted here or there and gets 20 years or 30 years or whatever, that's just kind of the cost of doing business. Mm -hmm. We'd rather have that than have some terrorist running free. I mean, it's so things have sort of flipped back upside down, and that may, part of that may also be why there's such a mistrust in certain communities in this country, people of color or recent uh, immigrants um, who feel that the law isn't fair to them and doesn't apply to them, the rule of law doesn't apply to them. Um, there is this growing distrust in the community um, of the police and the law as a whole. And you know, there's a lot of reasons for that, but uh, but some of it is is I think comes down to this, the uh, the loss of this understanding that we really de do need to err on the side of the innocent. Hmm. Hmm. And we touched on the the fallibility of, of the human element and and then the shift uh, in the change. I want I want to the the very sort of definitive statement of America's broken system. I'd like to dive into that a little bit sure. more. What are some of the major ways that elements of the justice system have just fallen apart and failed inside the United States? Well, one of the biggest is uh, the chronic underfunding of indigent defense. Um, the vast majority of people, you can go, go even beyond that and say, why is it that 80% of the people who are uh, prosecuted can't afford their own lawyers? Um, is it because poor people commit crimes and rich people don't? No. Um, you know, it, it, is it why is it that we focus so much of our resources on on prosecuting poor people? They're the grist of the of the conviction mill in our criminal justice system. And we lock them up for ridiculously long times. You know, we have five percent of the world's population in America, but twenty percent of the incarcerated people in the world. You know, an incredible imbalance, shocking statistic, uh, and that includes North Korea and Russia or any China, any kind of repressive regimes. Regimes, and partly it's it's the length of sentences that we have, and um, uh, and that gets disproportionately applied to the, to the poor. So when 80, 85 percent of the the people who are charged and processed in our criminal justice system can't afford their own lawyer. Um, you have, to, you have to ask why that is. Secondly... Well, I, I want to ask now wh why that is. Well, <laughs> you know, there, it, there's a whole lot of things. You can go, you know, part of it is, is a, a sort of a, almost a vicious circle, a self-fulfilling prophecy that happens um, where, um, you know, you see it in Stephen Avery's case, quite frankly. You know, there's... Uh, and, and other small towns all over the, the world, and all, certainly all over our country where you often will get somebody who's the police look at as sort of on the wrong side of the tracks. Hmm. Maybe he's a sort of a smart, smart mouth teenager. And you know, if you've ever seen a cop with an attitude, um, they don't like that, right? And so then that kid gets hauled in and he, he gets his first you know, minor record. And then that happens repeatedly. And then there's in, you know, an engendering of disrespect. So then, then maybe he's kicked out of school. Um, or even go before that, you've got, um, you know, you've got poor people who are evicted from homes, and then um, they pull them out of the school that they're comfortable in, and now they're into a different school, and maybe they're going to fail academically because of that, because they're constantly being evicted and moved into different schools, and they don't have that kind of support, and then that's going to make it more difficult for them to get the education, to get the jobs, and... Um, um, you know, it's it, so it's more complicated than, than I'm getting into and that mm -hmm. we can talk about today. But but back to the your first question, which is, um, what's the single biggest issue? If there is one single big issue, I would say it's the lack of resources given to people uh, who need to have somebody defend them. Mm -hmm. So um, it's not entirely just 
the defense side, the prosecutors are overworked, prosecutors are underfunded, courts are underfunded as well. Um, but just to give you one example, in Wisconsin, if you're, if you're appointed a, a staff salaried public defender, like I start off as, uh, you will get one level of, of care um, and representation. Um, generally better than if you don't get one of those lawyers and you're instead appointed a, a private attorney on a list. Because those people only get paid $40 an hour. And out of that, they're supposed to pay their rent, their uh, utilities, their staff, secretaries, assistants, if they have any. Um, when the average overhead, and not in a place like New York City where it's a lot higher, but the average overhead's probably somewhere 50 to $60 an hour. Hmm. So the, kind of, the quality of, of lawyers that you get willing to take those cases, you get what you pay for. You can't get a plumber to come to your house for less than 100 bucks. <laughs> and and you know, to pay lawyers only $40 an hour, when I started in 1981 in Wisconsin, it was $45 an hour. $1981. It's about five or six dollars now after inflation. Mm -hmm. So you end up with people like poor Brendan Dassey had, um, who are just trying to cut a deal and um, think their client's guilty. And um, but you know, there's a story in the book where I fell prey to that too. I was a staff lawyer, and you know, the, sometimes the the pressures of the public defenders have of having a continually open new cases whether you close them or not, you make snap judgments. And, uh, uh, you know, in one particular story, I don't get into it right now, but it's in the book, um, I made this snap judgment that a client was guilty and I was wrong. And my later wife proved me wrong. Um, <laughs> and what that told me was that, that I needed to get out of that kind of a rat race where I could right. practice law in a better way where I could um, control my workflow. Yeah. It, it seems interesting to note, uh, as, as we spoke about earlier, this sort of uh, the black and whiteness of the rule of law, but we've, we've moved into justice kind of as a business, it sounds like you're saying, to where the quality next to a price tag is, is actually relevant. So instead of a situation where we're taking the evidence that we have, the evidence that's presented, and applying that to the law, and coming to the correct answer, uh, the quality has skewed the justice system away from it. Well, it's partly because our system is set up to be, it's an adversary system. The idea is that if you have, and this goes way, way, way back into English common law, that if you have um, reasonably equal, competent advocates on both sides as adversaries, advocating for one side or the other, and then there's a neutral jury or judge in the middle, the truth will come out that way. Because you know you can always, uh, I, mean, I mean, think about when, when somebody tells you one side, their side of the story, and you hear it and it sounds believable until you hear maybe the other side of the story, you start thinking, well, maybe not. And if you have advocates for both sides um, and they're equal, then that's the best way to get at the truth. At least that's the English and American system. There are other parts of the world that, that use different inquisitorial types of techniques. But, uh, but what's happened is there is a huge imbalance where the, uh, the prosecutors, even though they're underfunded, they still have vastly more resources and, um, and money to, to put to a case than the defense. The Avery case is another example where the prosecution can can just call up the FBI, mm -hmm. you know, multi-million dollar budget and and stop everything and and focus on that one case. Defense can't do that, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and in the majority of cases, there's there's this really huge imbalance where the defense um, is no longer equal, uh, an equal party in that adversary system. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And even if you've got the dream team, um, you're still not ever going to be able to completely match the resources of the government because sure. it's, after all, they're just using your money, taxpayers' money. There's, you know, there's no end to that, right? 
or they just go print some more and yeah right 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 so it it does bring up another interesting thing that i would like to talk about which is judges and juries and i think i want to start with the judges side of it uh you know it's in the ideal presentation of the system you have the neutral judge uh, but you've talked before in other appearances about jaded judges or judges who are beholden to an electorate, especially state judges, they're all elected positions. Right. Um, when we get into elected judges, how much does the popularity contest affect justice being served? Um, and then when I say that, what I mean is, are we accurately applying the rule of law through the eyes of the judges, or are the judges bending more toward the will of the people? And if, and if that's the case, because they, they don't want to lose their elected, aren't, aren't they applying what the people in that area want as their laws? They might be, but the, uh, the system is set up with the understanding that the, the people, the populace, might be swayed by whatever is the politically correct winds of the time or the passions of the moment, rather than dispassionately applying the rule of law. So. Um, you know, this case, another example, you know, when, when the Stephen Avery case was in the pretrial setting because of the, the special prosecutor's press conference and the way the media was covering it, um, he was easily, you know, the, the most hated man in, in the state, easily, worse than, at least as much as Jeffrey Dahmer ever was. Um, more so, probably, because even though, even after Jeffrey Dahmer, they, they tried to get a, a ballot, a referendum to reinstate the death penalty in Wisconsin, which hadn't happened since 1853, the longest continuous period of time without it. They had never had a referendum on it. It was just a, um, they had tried a number of times um, after Jeffrey Dahmer in particular, didn't work. But after the press conference in this case, where Mr. Avery was, was uh, uh, you know, portrayed as this monster who cr did this horrible, brutal rape murder, mutilation, torture of this woman, all of which was uh, totally unsupported by the evidence, in fact, disproven by the, the physical evidence. He became so hated that the, the uh, legislature put a referendum on the ballot. It, it passed 55% people voted to reinstate the death penalty three months before his trial. Now, the legislature still had to act. It wasn't a binding referendum like you see in California. Um, and cooler heads finally prevailed. But that just, that's an idea of, of what, the, what a public sentiment uh, and passions can be. Now, people who've watched the documentary, even if you're not convinced in Stephen of Stephen Avery's innocence, um, they recognize that there's some real questions, they're unanswered questions. Mm -hmm. And they don't feel about it the same way as they did. And that, I use that as an example because now, you know, if judges only acted as the conduits for that kind of public passion, then the, the, there would be no rule of law. It would, it would sway back and forth with the winds as they blow rather than um, judges, uh, you know, applying the law as it should be applied, notwithstanding the pressures that they get from the populace. Hmm. I, I, just to sidetrack off of something you said there, do you, you, you mentioned uh, about the conversation of the death penalty being brought up, and, and I'm curious, do you think that that was a motivating factor uh, even prior to the case seeing the courtroom, prior to the press conference? Did they look at this as, hey, this is an opportunity where we can get this guy and we can use this to motivate this political whirlwind around the death penalty in Wisconsin? You know, I don't know that it, I would go that far. I think it was, much, it was a more personal animus about him, mm -hmm. between him and the Manitowoc County authorities. Um, I think once um, once it it hit the uh, uh, the media and and it became a big high publicity case, the people who had wanted all along to bring back the death penalty mm. saw that seized as an opportunity and seized on it as an opportunistic um, chance to to try and do that. Interesting. Uh, to get back on track on what we were talking about before, uh, you talked about the populace and the winds of change of the populace. That leads us right into talking about juries which, uh, you know, you've alluded before that juries are a problem. Juries can also become, jurors can become jaded, and that can affect, you know, the ability to make fair adjustment uh, mm -hmm. of justice in the room. And I think we all know in this audience that, you know, sequestration from information 
in today's age is nearly impossible. Mm -hmm. uh, are our peers still capable of forming juries that can deliver justice for us? Well, you know, that's, I think that's been a, a question for the ages. Um, you know, if you go back in um, the, at the founding of our country, we had uh, all kinds of pamphlets and, you know, many newspapers that were, you know, scurrilous gossip and unfounded rumors, not unlike what you see on the internet sometimes these days. Um, but it wasn't in the, in the same, it wasn't electronically shared, but it was still shared pretty widely with, with people who were potential jurors. Um, in small towns, you've always had the, you know, the, the gossip in the town or at the, the beauty parlor or, you know, the, the, the fence between the yard where there's, you know, there's things that are said about somebody who then they uh, may later have to judge as jurors. Um, and that could influence them too. So it's, it's more widespread now with the, the information age and um, the digital age, but does that mean that, the, that we can't still deal with it in our system? And I, th I think we still can, but I think it takes more effort by judges to ferret out people who can't. Mm -hmm. Not everybody can be a good juror. And even if you could be a good juror in one kind of case, you may not be well suited for this particular case that you're, you're brought in on. And um, it, you know, you can't, what you can't do is just say, I'll take the first 12 people who walk in, and those are gonna be the jurors. And no, we're not gonna ask any questions. And some judges rush that whole jury selection process through so fast um, that you end up with, with jurors who really can't set aside. The law has never been that a, a jury, juror has to come in completely ignorant of everything. But what they have to be able to do is whatever you know, pretrial information they've received, they've got to be able to truly and fairly set it aside and understand that what they heard outside the courtroom may not be true. And that what they have to base their judgment on is what's in the courtroom. Now, if you can't do that, then you've got to be honest about it and say, I can't do that. And a judge has to be um, careful to, to try and you know, ferret out those people who really aren't able to do it. So in this case, for instance, um, it came up late in the trial that, you know, every day the judge would tell that the jury was not sequestered until deliberations, and you can still do that. You take away their cell phones, and when they're in deliberations, they're, they're supposed to be cut off. But, in, you know, in a long trial, it's very hard to do that. And so, but they were told every day, you know, don't go on the internet, don't do any, you know, any computer searches, don't watch any TV or talk to anybody who's trying to give you information. And it came out as the, as the trial went on that um, one woman, uh, it turns out her husband was watching television and telling her everything that happened after they left the courtroom um, when the jury was supposed to be out and there were legal issues and some evidence was excluded, some would later come in, but all those things that usually jurors aren't supposed to be focused on, this, this juror's husband was telling her. Another one um, uh, was saying something like, yeah, you know, the judge always tells us that uh, don't search anything on your computer, don't do any internet searches, and, but you can just delete whatever you do. And no, they'd never know, how would they ever know? Right. And another juror spoke up and said, oh, no, 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 you don't understand, it's never really deleted. Um, they can find it. And then the guy just turned ashen and continued to deny it uh, when he was brought into the judge and questioned by the judge. Uh, one of the other jurors kind of ratted that person out. Mm -hmm. um, so, but you know, we took a long time searching for jurors in that case, but um, you know, but, but most time they don't. And so if that happens in our case, uh, if it happened in our case, although our case was more pu higher publicity than a lot, and that's the other thing, is the, the run-of-the-mill trial is not going to have that much information available on the internet or social media talking about it. Mm -hmm. So it, it is easier, I think, to still get jurors who are um, uninfluenced and unexposed to the kinds of information that shouldn't be coming in until they hear it in court. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting because that causes me to think about 
making a murder, this sort of docudrama that was put together after the fact. And I question then, is, is this helping because it is showing us the flaws and the cracks in the system uh, or knowing now, seeing the fallout from this, seeing the, the feedback that's come back in, questions about items that were omitted uh, from, from the series, uh, is it a net positive because it's bringing these in things to light or is it doing more harm than good because now we're also using another device that is influencing the way people are thinking, influencing the way people are interacting with this particular case, but other cases that are, are similar? Mm. That's a good question. Um, but I think on balance, uh, transparency is good. And I think that the, you know, making a murderer has, has done something really that nothing else has ever done. It's really caused, you know, we have people here today who are interested in justice and what happens in their courtrooms who really didn't know anything or care about it before. Um, you know, half the states don't even allow, approximately, um, cameras in the courtrooms. And the federal government doesn't have any, federal courts don't have cameras in the courtrooms. I've been a big advocate for them because it's, it's transparency. You know, people need to see what goes on. They need to, you know, it, those are representatives of them. Um, whether it's judges, that they, whether they elect them or not, they're, they're still representing the people. And, um, you know, it, things, corruption sort of seeps in in the shadows. If people are watching, and that's one of the reasons that the, we've cherished a free press, a free media for so long, is that, that they can expose that kind of um, you know, corruption. So uh, a documentary that, that sheds light on how the justice system works and doesn't work and the kinds of things that go on, I think, can, is always going to be positive. Um, there will be some naysayers, and there'll be some you know, potential fallout that could, could potentially, let's say, maybe make people lose faith in their system altogether mm -hmm. um, and you know, cause them to, to just despair. And it could un unravel things even further. Um, but I don't think it's, uh, anybody can say that this documentary was done in an exploitative way. You know, there weren't any reenactments of a crime. And you, know, you, you can see the difference between like an exploitative documentary and something that's just showing um, you know, what happens in a particular case. And then you, uh, you know, thoughtful people can take, take that and discuss um, what kinds of um, lessons we can learn to apply in other cases in order to try and get back to where justice should be. Mm -hmm. how, how do we then uh, address the, the omissions, the things? I mean, it is a finite amount of time that sure. you can actually have in this documentary, and there were over 200 hours of, of activity in the courtroom. How do we address then the things that were not on there that, whether intentional or unintentional, still affect, from certain perspectives, a bias about what that documentary is presenting? Well, you know, first of all, any documentary still has, it comes from a point of view. There's going to be bias of some sort. We're human beings, and they're human beings. Um, I think they've been unfairly portrayed as, um, as being more biased than they were be, by sort of deliberately leaving out very powerful pieces of the prosecution's evidence. That's simply not the case. Mm -hmm. And the way I know that is I had a front row seat. I saw. <laughs> What was at issue? You know, yeah, there was there's there's defense evidence that wasn't in there too, um, but you know, if you're if you're sitting on that jury, for instance, the the way you know what's really important to the parties is how much time do they spend in closing argument, talking about it, and um, you know, if you spend half a page, which is all Ken Kratz spent on his closing argument on the the sweaty hood ledge. DNA thing, um, you know, th then that tells you that that really wasn't that powerful piece of evidence, or we would have used it more. Mm. Um, and and so the same thing with some of the other things that he's been critical about being left out. I can tell you that the major issues that the parties were fighting about the the bones, the blood, the, the bullet, the key, um, those are covered in the documentary pretty well. In fact, 
you know, when I saw them do that in a total of about three and a half hours, I, I was thinking, well, why do we take six weeks? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I could have been home a lot earlier. Um, so, you know, they do try to present the, the, the issues that, are, that were most um, in dispute in, a, in as fair a balanced way as possible. The one way that it, you do get a little bit more of a defense flavor to it is because we cooperated and they interviewed us behind the scenes and they interviewed the Averys, um, but the, they had the same opportunity was given to the prosecutors and to the police. Mm -hmm. uh, the victim's family, I, I certainly don't fault them for not wanting to participate at all, but um, they haven't been critical of it either. Mm -hmm. But for somebody who had the opportunity to participate and give that other perspective, we thought all along that, the, that they were. Um, to then say, uh, you know, this is biased, you left all this stuff out. Well, you had a chance to try and participate and give some behind the scenes. I think it would have been interesting to see what it was like for prosecutors brainstorming and working on how are we going to present this issue and that issue. Um, they chose not to do that. Hmm. Interesting stuff. I want to go back to the, the core of what we've been talking about so far and, and by way of the, the, the Brendan Dassey case. Uh, one of the things that you had said in another interview was that you were surprised to the lengths which they would go to get this conviction out of this kid and just and, and bury it like completely and totally. My question is not, you know, about those links necessarily, but at the root of it, why? Why are there prosecutors and law enforcement officials and people embedded in the justice system that are willing to go beyond what even the law allows? to get that conviction, because that seems to be a major source behind the breaks that you talk about in the book. Yeah, and you know, again, there's, there's um, every case is a little different, but there's, I think, a little bit more personal animus that was motivating um, some of the things that were done here. Um, you know, Stephen Avery had the audacity to sue Manitowoc County officials who he believed wrongly convicted him and made him sit, you know, st stole 18 years of his life. Uh, and while doing so, allowed the real rapist to off go off and rape somebody else. Um, and again, it wasn't, you know, he's suing them for $36 million, and that's a huge sum of money for a county of that size. But it wasn't just the money that was motivating this. It, again, if you think about the cop, We've all probably had some kind of encounter with a police officer who's got a cops an attitude with you, right? And if you if you mouth back to them, you know that you you get their their dander up. You know they they get really pissed. And he was in the process of doing a, much more than that. He was in the process of embarrassing these people, not just the money, but to embarrass them and to expose what they had done. Um, to public view in a small community. And, you know, they um, were not, they were going to do anything that they could, I think, uh, to prevent that. And that's kind of the motivating thing that I think was going on in this particular case. And in other cases, it's, it's less so. Some, uh, one of the things that, that Dean talks about, you know, you, you see, you see police there's a whole spectrum of, of misconduct, from actually planting evidence against somebody or, uh, you know, uh, planting drugs on somebody that you arrest. Um, and by the way, we know it happens because there are documented cases all over the country, all over the world, where police manufacture evidence. That's the far extreme end. Um, another might be just where they, they come into court and they, they fudge or they lie. And they say, yeah, I saw him throw those drugs uh, throw something from his body, and then we went over and picked it up. What we used to call dropsy cases. It's like, come on, you know. It's, and he looked you in the eye. He sees you're, you're in uniform. You're coming at him, and right in front of you, he takes drugs out and drops them on the ground. <laughs> um, and yet, this is what officers would testify about all the time. Um, now, not all police are like this. Some, most of them, thankfully, are not. But in those kinds of cases. They think it, it, it's sort of the ends justify the means mentality that seeps in. And they may think that the person is a drug dealer, and therefore they are going to bust them. They don't think he's a completely innocent person that they're going after. Um, and so probably the majority of these uh, police 
misconduct cases are ones where they become convinced that they know whether the person is guilty or not, and therefore they're going to help things along. Um, and that's easier for most people to understand than the ones where they have such a personal animus that they're actually going after somebody to get him. Mm -hmm. And in this case, you know, we wanted them to call Brendan Dassey as a witness at our trial. We were ready for that because we were convinced that we could show that jury that, um, that this kid was subjected to deliberate, coercive, leading um, questions, feeding him the facts, none of which fit. And you can see how, why they don't fit, because he's trying to guess at what it is they want him to say. And he guesses wrong, but it's there. That, by the way, is one of the, another important transparency thing. Just six months before this uh, Dassey interrogation, the law was changed in Wisconsin to make it mandatory that all custodial interrogations be videotaped hmm. from beginning to end with no breaks. If there had not been videotape of what happened, those officers would have come into court and testified the same way that Ken Kratz did at the, at the press conference, giving a narrative as if this kid had, had just, it, you know, it all flowed out of him with, from being unburdened by guilt. Mm. When, it's, you know, when you could actually look at the videotape, you could see there was not, nothing of the sort. It's just these little monosyllabic utterances, and he's confused, and long pregnant pauses. And, so uh, we were convinced that, that we could uh, persuade the jury that the confession was false and that the techniques that they used were coercive and took advantage of a, of a young, inexperienced, quiet kid who had mental limitations and that if they were willing to go that far to try and turn him against Stephen Avery, then everything else was fair game too. We do want to leave time for the audience to ask questions. So if you guys can make your way to the microphones now, that'd be great, uh, and get those prepared. Uh, the, one of the best parts about the book is that it tells a grander story outside of the story that the, the Netflix documentary tells. And a lot of that is, is your story. Um, and you've prepared a piece uh, that you'd like to read for us. So I would uh, yeah, welcome I, I, you to do that now. You know, because uh, I guess authors are supposed to do that. So I guess <laughs> I have to read something. Um, but I, you know, I'm going to pick something that that um, is very personal to me. It's not legal at all, but it's in the book, and for a number of reasons. It's partly because I I went through this very serious illness uh, just a few years before um, the Avery case came to came to me, and part of the decision on whether I would even take the case hinged on, you know, how how clear was I from this very serious cancer. Um, and so I'm going to read a little section about how I discovered it and learned about it, and then I'll wrap up quickly thereafter. So uh, this is in the summer of 2001. I noticed there was a lump on my leg, very small, about like the size of your knuckle, painless. Um, no reason to think there's anything going on, and turned out to be a tumor the size of my hand, literally the tip of an iceberg. And... Um, uh, my wife persuaded me to go to the doctor's office, and I ended up in this specialist's office. I, I knew that we, we'd had the CT scan, and I knew there was something in there, but I was still hoping it was benign, and so this, this is what happened. So I called the specialist, Dr. Hackbarth, first thing on Tuesday, but the next available appointment was on Tuesday of the following week. At home, I pulled out the films and tried to read them, cross-sections of tissue in each leg. Dozens of thumbnail images, impossible to make sense of. I was pretty sure that I could see some form in the right leg that was not visible on the left. Kathy and I scoured websites for information. Kathy's my wife. Sometimes these growths were, were benign, and surely that would be the case with me. I felt fine. As a matter of fact, I was feeling more fit and trim after a beach vacation than I'd had in a long time. We were in modestly hopeful state as the appointment with Dr. Hackbarth approached. Even so, this time Kathy was coming along. As I'd learned before, working alongside her in court, having her there would do me good. We arrived at the orthopedic clinic at Frederick Hospital in Milwaukee early. Dr. Hackbarth took a quick look at the lump on my leg, then stuck the images into the light box, scanning them for a moment. 
We'll need to get a biopsy probably tomorrow, he said. I can tell you right now, this is almost certainly malignant. It's a soft tissue sarcoma. I'm guessing it's one of two types, and they're both quite rare and lethal. We used to just take people's legs with amputation, but we've gotten better at this. We will try to save your life and your leg, but you will definitely have a long year ahead of you with various kinds of treatments. As I stood over his shoulder, he went through the individual images that showed the abnormality, and he pulled up a full-length picture of both legs that I hadn't noticed before. The difference was stark. I couldn't tell what was me and what was tumor. The growth ran, ran so high up my leg that an amputation might involve not just the leg, but my hip, too. In any event, Dr. Hackbarth said he was going to do everything he could to avoid that. Just then, he got paged and gently excused himself. I'll let you guys talk about it, he said. I'll come back in a few minutes. A sinkhole had opened beneath our lives. Our son, Stephen, was nine. Grace, our daughter, was seven. Don't panic, I told Kathy. It's definitely, or it's not definite until the biopsy. Clear-eyed, Kathy would have none of my whistling in the dark. He knows already, she said. That's why he's telling us the other stuff. Then Dr. Hackbarth opened the door with an expression on his face that hadn't been there a few minutes earlier. It was now about 10.30 a.m. Milwaukee time. That page was, was for my wife, he said slowly. A plane has hit the World Trade Center, and it's collapsed. At first, Kathy and I gave each other a look that said, this guy's nuts. Let's get out of here. But as we talked further, it became clear that Dr. Hackbarth was telling the truth. In the car on the way home, the radio broadcasts were full of one alarming piece of news after another. A second plane had hit the other twin tower. The Pentagon had also been hit. Nobody knew where the president's plane was. People were in bunkers. A plane had gone down in Pennsylvania. The government had ordered all airliners to land and not to fly again until further notice. This was a horrible national tragedy. I felt awful for everybody. Kathy and I had been in New York less than a year earlier for another NACDL conference. We went to the World Trade Center and ate at the windows on the world. And yet, I couldn't help but think that I was going to be dead in a few months. I was 45 years old, and until now, I had not given mortality much thought. I was absorbed by Kathy, by the two little kids in our lives, and by work. What had I done to leave my mark on the world? My life had been a meaningless blip. So I often sometimes wonder, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm a person of faith. I, I, I believe in God. I'm a Catholic, born and raised. I sometimes wonder why did I make it through this system, uh, or through this illness, and, um, you know, maybe it was so that I could do a case like this, have all of these things develop, and become a spokesperson for justice, and who knows. But, um, you know, I had a long, hard year. And two years of learning how to walk again with physical therapy, and and um, ultimately I took the case. Kathy convinced me I was ready. Dean was confident I could do it, and I'm never regretted that. All right, so I'd like to open it up to questions from the audience. Why don't we begin over here? Uh, wow, heavy stuff. But let me try my question out anyway. Um, so in the case you described as Stephen Avery, it does sound like there was certainly a degree of like mal actual malicious prosecution. But the other half of the broken justice system you described seems to be more like broad strokes, like you know the uh, overworking, overburdening of the court system, disenfranchisement of minorities, overpopulated prisons, stuff like that. And I'm certainly sympathetic to that point of view. Like I, I feel it's broken as well. But I was wondering if you could perhaps take your lawyerly skills to advocate for what seems to be indefensible and maybe describe some of the good intentions that brought our justice system to this place, like what created these, what are the motivations that might have created these super long sentences or sort of the differing, the changes in how prosecutors uh, treat the courtroom and stuff like that? Well, OK. Um it, it's certainly understandable um, why 
people feel like there's, we need to have these real long sentences. Let's take that one for a sentence uh, for a second here. Um, you know, what what happens is um, there are um, there's something that's been documented in the literature, something called mor a moral panic, and um, in this context, you see it when when there's a particularly heinous crime that happens. Um, some young girl is murdered brutally and killed or, uh, by somebody, and maybe he's been in prison and gotten out, and you know he's like a serial killer or a serial rapist or something. Um, and we then react with moral outrage and um, you know want to increase penalties and and make. Well, how did this guy get out in the first place? And you know, we, if he would have been locked up, this never would have happened. And we should just have longer sentences, and we should make make it mandatory that so judges don't have any discretion. And it's the problem is it's a one size fits all type of a remedy that's based on cases that are really pretty rare. I mean, there were something like 20 million new charges filed last year alone, and the percentage of them that are those types of cases that really cause and, de and deserve moral outrage are very, very small. So, so to try and apply what you need in those few cases to everything, um, it may start off with you know, well-intentioned, but then it, it ends up screwing up the whole system when you do that. Another example is um, sex offender registration. Um, you know, the idea of registering people as sex offenders, which is like the scarlet letter of, of 21st century. Um, the idea was that, well, if, if there's a person that's living down the block from my children who's a sex offender, I should know that, you know? And um, in theory, that's fine, except for it, it ignores the, the reality, which is that 95% of child sex offenses occur from not a stranger down the block that you don't know about, but from somebody that you know very well, You're the uncle or the neighbor, the next door neighbor who's you know, close to the family, not a stranger, um, or the stepdad or whatever. And so having somebody registered as a sex offender does nothing to protect you in those situations. Um, but to, in order to, to, so they started off with a, a good idea that, yeah, for the, for the most serious kinds of sex offenders, we're gonna, we're gonna have them register. And then you can know if somebody really is, is a potential one of the stranger abduction type offenders in your neighborhood. You should know that, right? But then um, politicians, in order to try and act tougher on, and tougher and get elected and reelected, they started expanding the kinds of crimes that fit the definition of a sex offender for registration purposes to the point where even um, two teenagers who are having consensual sex but underage, therefore illegal, and, the, and usually it's the guy who gets convicted, now is a registered sex offender. And um, in Wisconsin, I mean, the people that you should really care about and be afraid of are, are just a handful. But when you go on the, the website, there's something like, um, it's between 25 and 50,000 people on that registry now the vast, vast majority of whom are not a risk to the public as, as a whole. So what happens to them? Now, we've, the hysteria has gotten even worse, and now we don't even want them living in neighborhoods or in communities. So, so towns are passing ordinances saying you can't live, if you are on that list, within 2,000 feet of a school or a park or a shopping center or you know, any place where kids can congregate. And as you start drawing the, the radius is around that, the city of Milwaukee, almost the entire city limits are off limits for anybody who's on that list. To the point where there are now over 300 homeless people who are on that list um, who cannot live any place in the city of Milwaukee. You're not allowed to move anywhere else either. Other counties say, oh, we, if you were convicted in Milwaukee, you gotta come back to Milwaukee. And it's so insane that um, this is a, a story that was in the newspaper just a couple of months ago. Parole agents are saying um, that 
you're not allowed to reside in the city, so go stay with your mother for a few days. Don't live there. Don't put your clothes there. And then go park your car in the, the uh, park and ride lot and live out of your car for a few days and then drive and go stay at your sister's for a few days. You know, it's just this, this shell game that, again, started off with an idea that maybe was valid but then got exploded out of all sense of reason by, you know, politicians really who are just trying to act tough on crime. I don't know if that answered all your question, but it gives you a few ideas. Good. I think we have time for another one. Yes. Um, as a defense attorney, um, how far do you go to try to understand if your client is guilty or innocent? And um, how does your belief in their guilt or innocent, innocence change uh, your defense strategy? Good, good questions, both. Um, it shouldn't change your defense strategy because uh, most of the time you don't know. Well, first of all, the vast majority of people, you know, if they're guilty, they tell you they're guilty. And you know, they, they want you to help them. They admit they screwed up, whatever their wrongdoing was. Um, but can it, So it's the job of the defense to, try, to humanize that person and let the judge know that whatever they did, it's a snapshot of them. It's not the whole person. You've got to look beyond that. Look at all the other things they've done in their lives. They've been a good father, they've, you know, they, or they pay child support, um, whatever it might be. Um, but uh, you know, the role of a defense attorney is not really to make the judgment about whether or not somebody's guilty. And I'm just going to tell the story. It's in the book, but um, I alluded to it earlier. And since, since you brought it up, here's a perfect example. Um, when I was a public defender, I'd been there for about eight, almost nine years. Um, we were under so much pressure, we had to open 15 new felony cases a month. And, and there was no case waiting at that time. We had to open those cases whether we had closed a single one or not. And my caseload was enormous. And, um, you know, a first degree homicide that was going to take a month to try or longer, like the Avery case, counted as one felony, just the same as a, you know, a garage burglary where a bike is stolen and the, the kid's going to get probation, an easy, what we would call an easy case. And so I started triaging these cases uh, when I, we would get them by going to intake court and meeting them for the first time. Really, all you're supposed to do is, is uh, figure out what the bail is. And, um, you know, give him, the judge some information for, for setting of bail. But I would read the complaints, and I would try and see, okay, this one's going to be easy, this one's going to be hard. I can only take a few hard ones this month because I've got these other big cases set for trial, and I need to fill my quota of some easy ones. So I'm reading this one, and this looks like a piece of cake. The guy's it's a burglar. He's, he's caught red-handed. He's inside this apartment building. And, um, you know, so I read it over real quick to him. And uh, is this true? He's like, no, man, it's not true. I'm completely innocent. And he, and he tells me this story. It's a ridiculous story. It's a, a complete cock and bull. There's no way. Um, and I'm thinking, OK, so this is going to be a pain in the ass. It's, I'm going to have to try this case. It's going to be take me you know, several days. So I come back to the office. And you know, I was real tired. I'd, I'd had like 25 or 30 cases I ran. So some of them I wasn't gonna, weren't going to have to keep. And my friend at that time, later wife, Kathy, um, said, how was your day? And I said, well, you know, it sucked. And you know, there's this guy, for instance. And he tells me this ridiculous story. And I told it to her. And she said, well, I'll take that case. I said, well, go ahead. Knock yourself out. So she did. She got an investigator. She determined he was telling the absolute truth. His cock and bull story was true. He was innocent, 100%. Case was dismissed. And that taught me a lesson. That kind of thing happens thousands of times a day mm -hmm. all over the country with overworked defense attorneys. And I started thinking, if that's the way I feel about a client, if, if I'm making those kinds of snap judgments in the first three minutes, is that going to affect the way I can really the effort I'm going to put in and the way I'm going to defend him or her. Um, and so that ultimately taught me I had to get out of the public defender's office. But it was also a lesson in why you can't 
um, as a defense attorney, it's not your role to make those judgments, particularly early on, because it, will, it could shade the way you investigate or not. Maybe I wouldn't have even gotten an investigator because the story was so absurd. Anybody else? We are running a little short okay. on time, so okay. we do need to wrap up. But before, uh, I just have one last question. Sure. We, we've touched a lot on all the, the breaks in the system, and unfortunately, this is going to be one of those questions that we can talk for another hour about. Uh, but I want to ask, what are some of the fixes that we should be looking for or that are in process, um, You know, things like the Innocence Project, things that are looking into these breaks in the system? What are some of the things that we need to be aware of about how we can sure. fix what's going on? Okay, and I do spend some time in the book uh, towards the end talking about some sol solutions and things we can do. One of the things we can do that everybody can do individually is really start to take ownership of your own court system. You know, not to, don't just be worried about what happened in you know, a distant state 10 years ago, the Avery case, but care about what goes on in your own court system. Now, that's not easy because everybody works and you've got, you can't go sit down in the courthouse and, and look at um, who's doing a fair job and who's not. But if you have a chance to vote for a judge or a sheriff or a prosecutor, often those are in off elections. So many people don't vote. You know, maybe 10 or 20 percent at most end up voting for judges and prosecutors and sheriffs who have an enormous amount of power in the system. And, uh, you know, you can make a difference. And just in the last year, voters threw out prosecutors in Cleveland, Chicago, Jacksonville, who had run traditionally on, you know, I'm just going to get tough on crime. I'm going to lock, lock people up and throw away the keys. You know, the clanging cell door kind of um, TV ads. When you see that kinds of thing, you, those kinds of appeals, don't fall for it. If anything, maybe vote for somebody who's not doing that. As that's enough alone if you don't even know the two people. But if you can educate yourself by talking to people who are lawyers um, and, and then exercise your right to a vote, you should, because that's your way to other than a jury. Well, here's one other thing. If you get a jury summons, don't just think it's like a, a root canal that you have to do. <laughs> you know, it's the one chance you have a, a way to, to actually participate directly in your judicial system. Um, but be honest when you're going through jury selection. If it's, if it's a case that's troubling you, you, you have a, your best friend was sexually assaulted and you just can't put that aside if it's a if it's a sexual assault case, then be honest about it and just say, you know, I really don't, I'd like to be fair, but I don't think I can. Um, and, you know, you'll, you'll see other things. If there, are, if there are legislators who are championing things like mandatory uh, videotape recordings of interrogations, you need to get behind that. There are organizations, by the way, that work on all different little issues that are a problem in the criminal justice system. And those are just a, a few of them. Crime labs, lack of independence is another serious one. Um, the city of Austin, Texas, just discovered that their crime lab for years had been using wrong data and unscientific procedures. They shut down the whole thing. The police wanted to reopen it, and, and um, they had to send their four DNA, or I'm sorry, six DNA analysts to this state-run uh, retraining program, and four of them were kicked out. They were so bad. They failed. So ultimately now they're, you know, the, the, there's a move to make that, the crime labs more independent so that they can do real science and not just get the results that the police want. Well, there's a, there's a lot more in the book. Unfortunately, we are out of time. The book is called Illusion of Justice. It's a great expansion onto the story of Making a Murderer. Uh, thank you so much for being with us here today. I You're really very appreciate welcome. it. Thank you. Thanks for coming.